That was great. And I guess we already had prayer, so we will go ahead and get started. How are we all doing this afternoon? Good, good. So welcome, and to, of course, Happy, Healthy, Holy. I guess that's gonna take a moment. Do you remember what we're talking about today, if you're here during church? Einstein. What was it? Einstein. Einstein, yes, we are gonna talk about Einstein too. It's part of this. How does nature fit in with this? Holy, healthy, happy. What's the role of nature, our relationship to nature? And just to recap very briefly, make sure we have context, framework, the model we're working with. The science shows that three quarters of our conditions are lifestyle driven, caused, potentially curable. And then we can use things that are working with nature, foreign artificial, therapies of last resort, it's all on the table, but there's a structure and a process. What are we here for? Connection. We are built to connect. And that's not just coming from the Bible, this is coming from science. All different realms of science, if you look at it long enough and start to look at the picture, we exist to connect. And the model that we're using to help us understand that and how that works is the whole person neuron model. And what we're gonna focus on especially today, there's the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and our connections on the horizontal and in the vertical, but what about the environment? What about the where and the when? How do we function in the where and the when, the environment around us, to be in sync with our creator and how we're designed to work versus fighting it, being out of sync, and things having problems because of that? Best health looks a lot like a community focused around health, a lot like a church. And actually, this picture fits in very well with what we're going to be talking about today and what Julie's going to be sharing with us. Uh, gardening, growing things, but working together in ways that we're connecting, we're enjoying it, and it's promoting health. And this connecting and this living is to produce what? All major world religions, atheists, neuroscientists, we all actually believe the same desired outcome of our existence, and that outcome is pleasure, wholesome pleasure on every level, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, so forth. God intends that we would enjoy our existence. The garden of pleasure. That's what Eden means, pleasure, the garden of pleasure. So last time we ended with physical activity, how that fits in to have vibrant, full living. And today we're gonna to be talking about nature and how that works. So I'd like to start this with just a little bit of a framework. Go ahead and grab a Bible in front of you, if you would. We're gonna to turn to the beginning of the book. The very, very beginning. <clears throat> and maybe I should grab the same version. Oh, thank you. Everybody else is using. So I just want us to start with the very beginning. The first day of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So what is God making here at the beginning? He's making light specifically. He's making time. This is the first recording of time. There's day, night. He's starting to establish a time process. The earth was without form. There wasn't really a where yet. So God is starting to create a where. So God is building the where and the when within which to do the rest of creation. He's setting up time and space, if you will. What there was before this, we really don't know, but at least as far as we're concerned on planet Earth, he's setting up time and space to then work within for the rest of creation, to create the natural world as we know it. So it's important to understand time and space. And this is where we get back to Einstein. 
Einstein's, well, we'll get into that in a moment actually. We'll come back to that. So he creates the day and the night. We start to have the time cycles that we exist within and creation in summary ends up something like this. We've got human beings, right? Sort of the pinnacle of creation, the, the masters or, or final top product, if you will. But you have all the natural world. You've got all the plants, you've got the animals, and things are working in harmony, in sync. So the fundamental question is, how did our good creator design this to all work together? Where did it get off track? Where do we get off track? And how do we get back in sync? Okay. Okay, so let's come back through this in a little more detail. So Einstein, his theory of special relativity. If you're here at church, what does that theory in summary tell us? Space and time. Are they separate? Are they the same? Or how do they relate? Two sides of a coin, yeah. This, this crazy thing that we don't perceive is they're actually like two sides of the same coin. Time and space are sort of one thing. We see one side of the coin, but then if we look at it from a different perspective, we see the other side of the coin. And that gets important again because it's the where and the when within which we exist. Now the other theory of Einstein, what is, what's the formula that Einstein's most famous for? E equals mc squared, yes. What is that? Energy, mass, and speed of light. E equals mc, okay, let's, uh, actually I forgot I had this in here. Special relativity is the theory that says space and time are really aspects of the same thing. It is space time. That's from NASA. They should know, right? And then um, E equals mc squared, energy and mass or matter are interchangeable. Matter is condensed energy. Did you realize that? That matter is condensed energy? There's a lot of energy in matter. Matter times the speed of light squared. That's humongous, to put it in technical terms. Humongous. Atomic bomb. Do you know what's going on in an atomic bomb? Massive release of energy. Massive release of energy from matter. So you've got X amount of matter before, you've got 99.99% of that matter afterwards, and that whatever it is, 0.01% of matter has turned to energy. That's a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy. The point of this, though, is that a lot of things that we perceive as being different or separate are actually either the same thing or very tightly interrelated. The universe is built as a whole. The parts work together. They synchronize much, much more than we realize. And we are part of that. We human beings are part of that. We, especially in America in today's modern life, tend to think, oh, well, it's just me. Everything else is separate. No, that's not how it's really put together. So we really have to understand that and how, know how to apply that if we're going to have the best health. Okay, so what are some of the cycles in which we live and function? What are cycles of time? Day and night, months, with the moon, years, with the sun and the earth, life, seasons, yeah. What's the one cycle of time that has no obvious basis in nature? The week. The week has no obvious basis in nature. It's very interesting. Very interesting, but very important. We won't get too far down that, that bunny trail at this point, but it's actually very interesting. There's a field of science called chronobiology. Do you, do you understand what that name means? Chrono, time, biology, physiology, function of living things. How do living things function relative to time within that space-time continuum? 
Why is this important? What's our number one killer in this country? Not cancer, heart, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. Yes, yeah, stress. That's what's underlying the diseases. Heart attacks. Do heart attacks any, have any time pattern? Do you know when heart attacks tend to happen? Nope. Nope, not at night. First thing in the morning when you get out of bed. That window, yeah. Do you know what day of the week they tend to happen more? Monday morning. Monday morning. Yeah, stress. Yeah, I wonder why. You got a surge of adrenaline and I got to deal with all the stresses again and, and my big heavy dinner from the night before is still clogging my vessels and comes crashing down. Perfect storm, that's right. How many of you have heard of the term circadian rhythms? Okay, good, a fair amount of you. Circadian, 24-hour time periods. Our biology, our physiology goes through big swings, big changes throughout a 24-hour day-night cycle. Why we have heart attacks first thing in the morning. Why we sleep at night. Why our blood pressure is going to be higher and lower at different times. There's a lot of different things that happen in a 24-hour cycle. And we start to get those out of sync, and or especially if it's a straight-up conflict, how well is that going to work for our physiology? Not so well. Not so well. Night shift work. When you have to be up and on your game through the night when we're supposed to be sleeping, does that have any health consequences? Dr. Lowry was telling us about <laughs> it wasn't working for him. Do you know it's actually considered a carcinogen? Rotating night shift work is considered a carcinogen by the World Health Organization especially for certain cancers, breast cancer, higher risk cardiovascular disease for night shift workers. It's in conflict with our circadian rhythms. It doesn't work so well. And do you remember when we talked about rest, what the things are that set our sleep-wake cycle that we have control over? Light? Set, we use the acronym SET. Sun, sunlight, sunshine. E, exercise, exercise, T, no, taste, food, sunlight, exercise, taste, food. Those are the three big levers that help set our circadian rhythm for when we wake up and when we go towards sleep. Those are things we have control over. And again, depending on how we do those, we do better or worse. What about the American habit of doing our big meal of the day late in the evening? Is that in sync with how the body wants to work or out of sync? That's really out of sync. It's really out of sync. When you look at the science, just like a fireplace, you want to put the fuel in when you're going to want the fire to burn. And when you need to shut the system down for a while to let it rest, then you want to leave it empty. Then it can actually rest and not just keep working. Okay. Now, there's a some of the easiest ways to think about some of the natural world in this construct of time and space. In scientific terms, how do we categorize the natural world? What do we call plants and animals? Flora. flora and fauna. Yes, flora and fauna are the scientific terms we use. Basically, plants and animals. Okay. So plants, what about plants? What's the relationship between plants and human beings? We eat them. Okay, primary fuel supply. Oxygen, yeah. The whole, the whole air cycle, oxygen and carbon dioxide, we use the opposite ones and we give off the opposite ones and it works really well, back and forth. Why is it a problem that the Amazon rainforest is getting wiped out? That, that's the all-stars of the plant world for this whole air cycle thing. We're wiping out the all-star team. Let's cut them all down, make money, eat things other than plants. Okay, so plants. Now, where this gets interesting scientifically, there's a ton of research in this space. 
But one of the things that hit my radar here a couple years ago that I just kind of did a double take, it's like, I haven't heard that before. Forest bathing. I think I may have mentioned it before. Came across this thing, there's science on forest bathing. I'm like, what in the world? Out of Japan, they have a Japanese name for it. It's sort of doing like you do sunbathing, but in the forest. Though you're not necessarily having to have your skin exposed, you're just hanging out and enjoying it. Sometimes called nature therapy. But you're just out enjoying experiencing the natural world as kind of your primary thing. And again, there's a ton of science, and we can just go on and on and on, spend the whole time easily just going over all the physiologic scientific studies. But it lowers your heart rate, your blood pressure, lowers your stress hormones, reduces your inflammation, reduces anxiety, reduces depression, even lowers your blood sugar. It's like, wow, even blood sugar, that's pretty cool. So there's a lot going on with this in terms of how it impacts us physiologically and our health. Why do we, I guess they're gone, why do we do flowers in church? It looks nice, which makes us happy. There's actually studies that showing flowers make us happy. There are, there's scientific studies showing flowers make you happy. Um, other things that have been documented other than this kind of physiology, functional effects. Do you know that spending time in nature or having plants in your environment can improve your memory and concentration? Studying for a test, have your plants around you. Actually makes a difference. Uh, healing time, when people have plants around them, they actually heal faster, physically. They physically heal faster. That's why some hospitals and rehab places put all the plants in there. Happiness from flowers, people have more energy. They feel better, they've just got more oomph to do things. And of course, it reduces stress. They've even found that plants help our person-to-person -person relationships. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So a ton, ton of science um, around plants. And now we have a special guest. Julie Millers, and you can tell me if I got this terminology right. I didn't talk with her about this at a time. Can I call you an aficionado? Sure. <laughs> Small form aficionado. Uh, Julie and Gordon have some pretty cool property, do some pretty cool stuff. We've um, benefited from some of the produce at different points in time. But I've just asked her to come share with us about this, kind of up to her what she wants to share, but in this vein of how do we engage with the natural world and plants specifically in the real world practice. So I like what she's doing also because as I work with patients and we're trying to get them connected with premium fuel, this is what she grows. Whoops. <laughs> well, I have the fun part, I think, because I'm gonna be talking about something that I love to do and I've had the pleasure to be able to do this and I'm going to have if more of these front lights can go off that would be great for me We're streaming. We need some light, some light. you don't need me just that <laughs> so, so um, I liked a lot of what Mark was talking about and I, I uh, feel that getting out in nature is important and you talked about relationships and in the garden where I'm at uh, the relationships really grow because people are visiting me all the time there. Well, that's perfect. I don't know if it's good for streaming, but it's perfect for me. You can turn one up, apparently. So in Genesis 2, 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, to work it and take care of it. So I feel like I'm following the first vocation that uh, God directed us to do, to work in the garden. And so I'm really privileged to have that opportunity. <clears throat> now, everyone here may not have a farm or a lot of big property, but it doesn't mean you can't enjoy nature. 
I don't know if there's park bathing, We've got the forest bathing, but if you get to a park, I think it gives you that same kind of happiness. I think I have a son out there that would disagree because he really likes the forest, but um, parks can do the same thing, make you very, very happy. And uh, some of you may recognize this park, Bouchart Gardens, everyone, if you haven't been there, you should go. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful, uh, creation, probably not near as beautiful as what Eden was, but it's something that that we're trying, and they have all you know hundreds of people that work there to make this beauty. So if your garden doesn't quite look like that, don't be discouraged. We don't have all those people, but we can still have a great garden. So how did I get interested in gardening? You can see I love flowers, and that's actually from our farm. Um, I love flowers, and I think the love came from my grandfather. We lived in Ontario, Canada, and my grandfather had a place when his kids were growing up. People would come from miles around. Remember, there's no Facebook or anything, word of mouth. Uh, miles around to just go by and see his gardens because they were so beautiful. And uh, so I think maybe some of this garden stuff is kind of in the genes, the genetic makeup. So I've always loved flowers, but uh, as Mark said, Gordon uh, had a farm, and when we got married, I got to uh, play in the farm. So that was pretty interesting. He um, had an idea that the farm should be like a patchwork quilt. So as you can see uh, up here, it kind of looks like a patchwork quilt. And the interesting thing is um, a lot of people are concerned about the chemicals and everything that's in our, our food nowadays. We try as much as possible to be organic in most all ways, so all your vegetables, grapes, different things are all organic, but there's that patchwork quilt and um, different things up there. I'm going to take a look here. Anyway, there is an orchard with lots of pears and apples, etc. And then down in this area is all your cane berries, blueberries, it's, and, and grapes down in here. Orchard area is going to be up here. And these are where the vegetables are brewing. So that's part of the farm there. That's just another picture showing it closer up. The interesting thing is I don't use any fertilizer on my vegetable gardens. And you may wonder how can your vegetables grow? You're not fertilizing, but we do use what we call a cover crop. And what's interesting, when you don't use a lot of the um, pesticides to kill the insects and different things, you invite the good insects into your area. Um, so they're eating the bad stuff. You don't have to worry about it so much. And uh, things work really well. This is what I call my natural pesticide. So at our farm, we have all these bird boxes surrounding the perimeters and it invites the swallows in. It's really great. The swallows don't like fruit, so they're not eating what I don't want them to eat, and yet they're eating all these insects that uh, could do harm. So that's really great. And at night, I know we have some bats that are working too. So that's one way if you're gardening and you're thinking of inviting some birds, the swallows are really a great uh, bird to have if you have a house and they're not getting onto your house, but um, they're uh, really great. So <clears throat> in the beginning, when you're starting a farm, you know, you have to wait a few years or you're starting plants at your house. So you put in a blueberry plant and then it might be two or three years before you're actually getting a lot to eat. So farming does teach you a bit of patience. Gardening teaches you patience besides the nutritional value you get. Now, after a couple of years, you may be getting blueberries like this. And what's interesting, and I, I'm, I'm not bragging here, but we have people who come out and they go, your blueberries taste 
so good. Uh, we've never tasted anything like this. I think part of the reason, if you're gardening too, uh, pretend you're like Adam and Eve out there gardening, you need to wait till they're ready to be picked. I think a lot of pe people pick things way too soon, so the taste value is not up there, and also your nutrition is probably not as good as if you'd waited. So here's a tip, if you've got a garden, wait till they're ripe and then eat them. I remember someone coming out to the farm and asking me, why do yours taste so much better? He grew berries just not that far down there, and I told him that, and the next year he came back, I can't believe it. My berries taste really good. I, I waited. <laughs> so there's a simple tip. Wait. And um, that's just me showing you. See? That's a pretty big blueberry. But blueberries don't all have to be big. It seems like nowadays everybody wants, when they come out, they all want big berries. They're not necessarily the best tasting, but um, in fact, there's a berry called ruble that is quite small and it has the highest antioxidants and it's a wild blueberry and it is really flavorful. Um, I have people who are, oh boy, they'll, they'll have nothing but the ruble, but most people don't want to even try them because they want the big berries. Just know big isn't always best, but, but can be really good too. So we also grow, just showing you uh, grapes, and um, if you look carefully, you'll see some netting. Like you in your garden, you may have problems with some pests, and I don't know the answers in gardening uh, to get rid of pests completely. Deer are one of my, can be one of my biggest pests. We have a big uh, fence. So just if you get deer come in, there are a few things you can do. You can look it up. I don't have time to go over that. But um, it's gotten so bad that if I was to see Bambi the movie again, I would be cheering for the hunter. So <laughs> just gives you an idea. <laughs> deer can really demolish a, a lot of your stuff. So if my key, if you have new things growing and you don't, you do have deer in the area, put a net or something up, do something to protect it till it can get big enough and the deer aren't going to take everything out. Just some grapes. So that's just more things from the farm that we grow. And um, the nice thing is, why do I like growing? Number one, I like growing things. I know how they're growing. So I know that they're growing with little, you know, no pesticide. They're organically growing pretty much. So that gives me pleasure. Why would I want to give you something that I wouldn't eat. So I feel I, that, that that's really great. And having people come out, the connection you're talking about, I've, um, you cannot believe the connection you have with people who come out and look forward to uh, seeing you again, not only the things you're growing, but seeing you. So there's a great connection on the, the farm. And just think, I'm out there all the time. I must have lots of happiness because I'm always out there. And it is true. You get out there and it's kind of hard to be really angry, upset or whatever when you're surrounded by uh, a lot of beauty. God knew what he was doing when he put man in the Garden of Eden. He knew that's what we needed. So what if, oh, more things, uh, blueberries, and those are pink blueberries. And I think I have, these are uh, pink blueberries, something that's fairly new. And they are, if you haven't tried them, you should. They're really, really good. Um, so like I said, we grow lots of tomatoes. You got your heirlooms there and the regulars. And we have a lot of people here in the church who bring some of their produce from their farms or their gardens every year, which is really great. Um, so this is just, again, vegetable gardens. There's Gordon overlooking the, probably thinking of what he's going to do next. <laughs> the nice thing about uh, what we did is he took care of all the irrigation, anything to do mathematical with water, anything, and I took care of the plants. It worked really well. Um, so that's why this farm has turned out to be pretty successful. And, um, you know, like again, no fertilizer, no, I'm not adding any chemical fertilizer. And you can see those look pretty good. 
And how do we do it? Again, it's a cover crop. So you, you just put that down every year and turn it under in the spring, and there's your natural fer fertilizer. You don't have to be putting the other on there. So this is the connection. People come out. This is, by the way, my granddaughter when she was little putting her chubby hands into a, a box of blueberries. And they, they are always talking about coming to the farm and getting to eat the stuff and seeing their uncles and aunt. So we have the connection, people get out. You cannot imagine the times that people come to, the, to my farm, the garden area, and they say they feel so peaceful and that goes along with it. They don't know what it is. So we get a lot of people coming back again because they just love, uh, I've had a lot of people say this reminds me of heaven. I thought, oh, we, maybe not. But you know, it gives you that peace. So the passion of gardening, you don't have to be a major farmer to get that, that peace and that passion. At your home, you can grow container plants um, and, have that happiness along a fence. See, somebody was pretty smart there and put up these uh, these flowers. Or you can have your little raised garden yourself. And again, you get the pleasure of working in the garden and you also know what's gone into your plants, what you have done, what you are eating. I even though things sometimes are labeled organic, I always wonder <laughs> when they come from another country. Uh, that's just me. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to know uh, what's happening. God said, or Jesus said, I am the vine and God is the gardener. And that's why I think when you're outside in the park, in the forest, in the garden, you are close to the heart of God and making that connection that he wants for all of us. So I'm going to again encourage you, no matter the size of your place, an apartment to a, a, a large home estate, you can get out there and enjoy. And if not, you can go to Bush Park, you can go to Silver Falls, but you're going to make that connection with nature. But as far as food goes, I think um, going to a place or getting your food where you know how it's been growing is really important, uh, especially nowadays when sometimes we don't know. So thank you. I think I kept it to the 10 or 15, didn't I? <laughs> thank you, Julie. that firing back up again. Yeah, I actually I grew up for many years with my grandparents, uh, actually in the Portland area. And my grandfather was a master vegetable gardener and my grandmother did the flowers. And so I grew up, you know, in the fall we'd be harvesting the stuff and we'd be canning and freezing and we'd eat it all year round. And I'd go to school and the kids would be going, ew, yuck, vegetables. I'm like, what? What? What's the problem? <laughs> Until I eat the cafeteria vegetables. Okay, I get it. I understand. So yes, it makes a huge difference. And the whole organic space is interesting. There's a lot of confusion around it, and you don't know what to trust oftentimes. In the organic space, organic means they didn't use certain synthetic pesticides, basically. There are some organic pesticides that scientifically have toxicity. I mean, that's why they're pesticides. And then there's the issue of the soil quality, which goes into the nutrition and the flavor of the produce, which organic doesn't address really at all as far as a national standard. So it gets really interesting. Okay, so thank you very much, that was awesome. So that was flora. What about fauna? What about the plants and animals? I mean, the, the animals in this case. Do animals play a role in our existence historically? Okay. Okay. What have human beings done with animals over time? 
What's that? Domesticate. Domesticate. For what purpose? Pets, companions, work? How was America built early on? Automobiles and tractors? Horses. Horses, mules. Yeah, work animals. Um, war. Interesting, in North America, looking at the history, it wasn't until horses showed up in North America that there started to be this increased movement and bigger wars were possible. And they started using horses for war. You know, bows and arrows and whatnot initially, but um, very interesting stuff. So animals have been a significant part of our experience since the beginning. And as far as the creation story, when were animals created and when were people created? Same day, yeah. So you got the birds and the fish, but then all like the land mammals and human beings, same day. Same day, and you start to look at the bone structure and whatnot of different animals, there's a lot of similarities. You can see how a lot of people with evolution try to connect the dots. But there are a lot of fundamental similarities. And actually a lot of our DNA is very similar, but a lot of that DNA just says, oh, we'll make a leg bone and put it at the end of this other bone, and well, that's very similar across different animals. What about in scientific or medical terms? <clears throat> Have you heard of pet therapy? Yeah, the science on this gets really interesting and, and what effects animals have on people. Um, lots of different effects. Again, there's a ton of science, but just a brief overview. Pets, hanging out with pets in a positive way lowers our stress hormones, lowers our blood pressure, decreases loneliness, even lowers your cholesterol. Do you know a pet can lower your cholesterol? And increases exercise. Got to take the dog out for a walk, right? We just went for a walk uh, yesterday and we're sitting on a park bench. This guy comes down the sidewalk with his dog and just comes straight over to us and starts talking and we're interacting with the dog and he, the owner gives me a treat to give to the dog and it was just kind of fun. It increased socialization and he was out exercising with his animal. Uh, improves mood, increases social support, and so on and so on. Now, how many of you heard in the last couple of years about these companion animals on air flights? Have you seen the news? Uh, people have gotten a little bit carried away with it. <laughs> I've heard stories about people taking their companion pig on the airplane, or I think I even heard of a peacock. It's like, what? Taking a peacock? on an air flight as a companion animal. So they started putting, sort of damping that down. Wasn't working out really well. But animals and human beings go together very well um, and there's a lot of health benefits. Bringing animals into like nursing homes and just letting the people, you know, pet an animal. You're gonna see physiologic changes. You're gonna see heart rate reductions. You're gonna see stress activity reductions, blood pressure reductions. And it's going to do what? Bring a smile to their face. They enjoy it. We enjoy it. It's what we're built for. Okay. Now, the last concept here for today is this concept of environmental engineering. And this is actually in the Bible. Do you know what some of the first recorded scientifically sound laws of public health are where they're found? Leviticus, yeah, so Leviticus, what God did with Israel, specifically in the wilderness. God gave a lot of instruction about here's how you lay out your camp, here's how you do sanitation, here's how you do organization, here's how you interact with the people around you and how you don't. That's getting into social and moral and spiritual dimensions. But as far as public health and sanitation goes, some of the first recorded laws are actually back there with Israel in the wilderness and in the first books of the Bible. So environmental engineering is actually a really important concept. A lot of what God did for his people then, what he does for us now, I heard a couple mentions just today about how blessed we are as Adventists understanding what we understand about health. Well, how does that work? Well, it's instruction on how to be in sync with the natural world 
And a lot of that is in terms of environmental engineering. What do you do with your environment, with your where and your when, your time space, and how we synchronize with the natural world in that time and space? So one of my favorite examples of this is, there's a book called Mindless Eating, a researcher who studies why human beings do what they do with eating. It's actually a fun book because they do all these funny experiments where people don't know what's going on. They see what pushes their buttons and what doesn't. They do things like, they had a, a test um, restaurant set up. And for one meal they had bowls of soup with a little tube coming in the bottom underneath keeping the bowl of soup always the same level to see how much soup they'd eat if the bowl never got empty. That's sneaky. <laughs> That's sneaky, yeah. You know, so all these kind of funny experiments, um, one of my favorite ones is they have people coming to an after lunch movie at a movie theater. They've just had lunch and they give them a free bucket of popcorn and a soda. What they don't tell people is this popcorn has been sitting out for five days. It's stale as can be, it's awful. But they give them different sizes of buckets. And they wanna see if the size of the bucket will affect how much popcorn they eat. The popcorn is terrible, they're not hungry, they've just gotten done eating. So they ask the people, do you think the size of your bucket affects how much popcorn you eat? Oh, of course not, that's ridiculous. It totally did, totally did, absolutely. The size of the bucket, they ate proportional size of the bucket. That's what actually pushes our buttons. So what I like about this book is it's not only a fun read and they do these funny experiments that pulls out what's reality versus what we think is reality and how we work, but at the end of each chapter he's got re-engineering strategies. Based on this science, here's what you can do with your environment to re-engineer it and then don't worry about it. Set yourself up for success, make it easy to do the right thing that you want to do, and then don't worry about it anymore. Because otherwise, every time we have to face another decision and try to do it on pure willpower, that's a rough way to live, and it doesn't work out really well. So the science shows re-engineer your environment and then get on with living. Make it easy. So one of the most important things we can do in healthy living and this is true not only of physical health, but also social and mental and spiritual, is to specifically, intentionally engineer our environment. So coming back to food, one of the things that science shows is really important is just the size of your plate or your bowl or your glass. Do you know you can eat 20 to 25% less food just having a smaller plate and you never know the difference. You're not any less hungry, any less full. You, you have absolutely no awareness that there's anything different. You're just as happy and just as satisfied. But in America, we've gone to this supersize me thing. We want the big gulp and the big bucket and the big whatever. We think it's more valuable or something. But the science shows the simple act of taking your, what's now regular sized dinner plates and going to the old size of dinner plates, like from 100 years ago, you will eat 20 plus percent less food and be just as happy. What do you think 20% fewer calories is gonna do for the midsection? A lot, a lot. So those are the kinds of things you want to understand what the issues are engineer your environment, meaning manage it, and what was mankind set up to do in the beginning? Here's all this creation, what did God tell to mankind was their role? To manage it, to take care of it. We were designed to be caretakers of all this cool stuff God made, as part of it. So let's manage it, starting with ourselves in our own immediate environment, and then we can Talk about the bigger picture. So environmental engineering is actually a really important and powerful concept. And for the last little bit, I'd just like to hear from you all how you have done similar things 
interacting with flora, fauna, time, space. We heard from Dr. Lowry already what he's done. He's gotten off the pathway to physician burnoff that he was on. He's engaging with the natural world, the natural cycles, and he's getting the benefit. And you're being told from multiple people, you look 10 years younger. I mean, how cool, and you feel good, and you feel better, you're enjoying life more. So there's a great example. He has re-engineered his environment together, the two of you. Yeah, amen, amen. Holy, healthy, happy. God intends for us to enjoy our existence in sync with how he set it up. So what else has worked for you? Just little examples. Do you see it in your life? Yes. What's that? You see better now. Lowered my quarter? Prescription? Oh, okay, cool. Cool. Cool, cool. Yes. Let me see if I can grab a microphone. Are those microphones still up here? I'll, I'll just repeat it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I, ate, I hated eating salad when I was younger. Hated eating salad. I grew up in a household that always forced salad on us. And we didn't have any chance for putting dressing on it or anything. It was just plain salad. And then they would use this machine where we would just shred everything. So it was very compact and tight kind of salad. Loose. Very unappealing plain salad, okay, forced on you. Right, and we weren't allowed to have any dressing on it. So that's how I grew up um, with my sister and other um, relatives. And so when I um, got out of the household, I decided I was never going to eat any salad whatsoever. Then I, um, a few years back, I started finding changes in my body. Um, so then I decided I'm going to go back to trying to eat salad, but I just couldn't stomach eating it without something. So then I would put loads, load tons of ranch dressing and other things on it. Then I was told that isn't really helping you anyway. You know, you had the, the salad, but then you're just ruining it with all the other stuff, high sugars, lots of cheeses, so on. So then now I've slowly started cutting back and I'm now doing balsamic vinaigrette, so no cheeses or much sugars, but I'm slowly um, you know, changing it. And I'm noticing a lot of difference with my body. I'm trying to get to the point where maybe I might just use extra you know, balsamic vinaigrette, the pure plain thing, or maybe just extra virgin olive oil on it. But right now, that's a little too much for me. It's just a little too plain. So I'm, but, but slowly, I'm slowly making that change. So now I'm able to actually eat salad and I'm really happy about that. Cool, cool, thank you for sharing. Sounded like some uh, child salad abuse there. <laughs> Anyone else? Things that you've discovered in your own experience. I mean, we're going back to the good plant food stuff there. Uh, a couple years ago, um, I decided I wanted to have more time with God in the morning. And But when I first wake up, I'm just, if I try to uh, have my prayer time, then I just fall back to sleep. So I asked God, what, what can I do? Because I want to spend time with you. And um, he impressed me that I could, you know, talk with him on my walks um, out around the neighborhood. And I have, my, um, my doctor that I go to for my yearly uh, female exam, she said, what are you doing? Whatever you're doing, keep it up. Cause, um, and it, it was just adding that being out in nature talking with God, you know, on my walks. Um, it, I know it lowers my breath, blood pressure. I breathe more slowly. I like just drink in the bird songs and the beautiful flowers. And it's, yeah, I, my time with God um, in prayer is, I miss it when I'm in the house a lot now. I'm like, Thank you. 
Were you going to say something, Peggy? Anyone else? Yes, right over here. Well, I've been on this Dr. Furman's diet for, I don't know, February, February, March, April, about almost three months. And I went in for my checkup last week, and my blood pressure was low, and I mean, it was perfect. And uh, uh, my heart rate was good, and she said to me, what in the world are you doing? And I said, I just changed how I eat now, and I do, I do exercise. I go to water aerobics, and I walk a mile a day, and stuff like that. And she said, well, I don't know. I wished I, I, wished I could come in and get those, these results. She said, these are the best you've ever had. So it had to be the diet, just changing everything. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. One or two more. Right back here. I had a kind of a misunderstanding before I came here from Peru to here. Mm -hmm. You know, in Peru, um, I saw people, very rich people, going to McDonald's and to the pizzeria. And also, you know, walking. That for me was a kind of a poor lifestyle. You know? So when I moved here, the first thing I did is go to McDonald's and buy a big hamburger. And I realized that that was not good. You know, I find out um, unhealthiest people were eating there. And then I, have, I didn't have a car, so in order to go to college, I have to ride on my bicycle 12 miles every day, you know, six miles. And then, and then I realized that was the best thing I was doing because uh, I, my life was surrounded for many obese people. So, and now I encourage my daughters, you know, living simple is the best to be healthy, happy, and holy. And now I help people uh, to recover from lifestyle disease. And just, uh, we were helping, uh, for this, this person has been, uh, for more than 20 years, diabetic. And just changing his lifestyle in about a month, he has lowered his 50% uh, of his medication and also it's out of cholesterol and high pressure medication. Just eating very simple. So uh, sometimes we see things that is, uh, that you know, it's what maybe richest or the healthiest people do. But it's uh, being simple is the best. Yes, thank you. One more? Has anybody here had trouble finding a parking spot before? Um, I, I go to school at Willamette University right now and they have uh, a minimum number of parking spots for, for students and faculty and everybody else. So it's, it's often very hard to find a parking spot there. And that's part of the engineering of the environment, right? So in a way, they've encouraged people not to bring cars there. And some of the reasons there, I'm sure, are, are to save money, and others are probably to try to have an environment that's more, more positive for walking around. But I got a job this spring at a local law firm as a law clerk, and I needed to go back and forth from school to that spot. But the problem was, is their parking lot's always full at Willamette, so there was no place I could get back to. So I realized what I was going to have to do is I was gonna have to walk back and forth, you know, to run quickly back and forth between school and the place that I was gonna be working. And I, I looked, at, looked at the time I had and I figured I can just make it, I can just do it. And so I was going back and forth, kind of, kind of annoyed about this at first, until over a little bit of time, I realized maybe these walks were calming me down a little bit through a hectic, hectic day. It was an opportunity to get out and to get some sunshine or some rain. Um, and, and enjoy the outdoors. And it was just a little bit ago, one of my friends was pulling out of school and he said, hey, I can give you a ride over there. I ended up telling him, you know, thank you, but, but I'll actually walk. I, 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 this is my one chance in the day to get some time to you know, think and, and be outside. And luckily, Bush Park is in between both places. So to, to see some green and to, to, to have some sort of a meditative experience. So engineering the environment yes. can have interesting consequences that can, sometimes you think it's gonna be a bad thing, but you realize, you know, once it's, once it's happened, I guess like my wife in the salad, um, <laughs> once you can turn back and say, hey, you know, this is, this is not such a bad thing, your life can change for the positive. Yes, awesome, thank you. 
a lot of what we perceive in modern life, whether it's coming to this country from another country or what we tend to value in day-to-day -day modern life, we get things backwards. And the really valuable, important things are the things that we tend not to value, like the walk, the good food. So it's, it's part of this um, and letting God be in charge is helping him helping us to reorient to reality and not our misconstruings as humans of reality to what actually works. Okay, so just to wrap up, this is about something better, a better life, fuller life, what God has in mind for us. Our last session is next Sabbath, and it will be on the topic of the spiritual dimension, which I see as being the best part and the culmination of all of this. What really is spirituality? What really is the spirit? How does that work? How is that part of whole person health? Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Gracious Father, thank you. You intend abundant living for us. You intended us to thrive, to fully enjoy our existence, and that existence uh, to be forever. I ask you would continue your work in each of our lives. Help us to see your reality and where we can be in sync with you and the natural world in time and space as you've designed it, and to thrive accordingly, and then to be able to share that with other people, that they also can be in sync with your plan and reality, and enjoy it. In Jesus' name, amen.